Good afternoon. Sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ray. Ray Tam. I'm not James Lee. Um, James Lee is sitting right here. He's actually one of my uh, best friends uh, for a long time, and my name, uh, I, I'm actually VP of security here. Um, and James Lee, you know, uh, he's actually one of the uh, smartest guy I've ever met here. Um, and, you know, security is like everywhere, right? Um, you know, from banking to finance to, you know, transportation and even to entertainment. Um, we're glad that we're part of, uh, you know, the solution for what uh, AEG put together. And uh, welcome, James. Ladies and gentlemen, James Lee. Yeah. All right. Everyone can hear me? Awesome. So what we have today, a uh, quick agenda is what we described from the video, as you saw, is who is AEG. So we're not an insurance company. We're not some cruise line, we're not a weapons manufacturer, and we're not an appliance manufacturer, as you've probably seen in some European countries. So we are an entertainment company, um, and what we do is concerts, festivals, touring. Um, we basically have over 100 million guests have been entertained in our venues. Um, I believe, I talked to Bill back there, and he has uh, one of our facilities that he helps manage from, from Trace 3's perspective is uh, the KFC Yum Center. So we also have LA Live and the Staples Center. If you guys have ever gone to Coachella Stagecoach, have any of you attended that this year? Yes, no, no, people don't wanna say they did. <laughs> um, so those are part of our brands that uh, you probably have heard of, but you probably haven't interacted with AEG directly with. So our business background is that we've had small venues all the way up to large scale venues. So we have something as small as like the Roxy, which has 500 people capacity. Um, that goes up to something like Staples Center, which has 20,000 capacity, which goes up to Coachella, which we entertain 125,000 people per day. Um, so some of you are probably curious as well too, which is, with 125,000 people, what does it take to manage that? So there's 25,000 plus people behind the scenes making sure all those 125,000 people are having a good time. So in our business, merger and acquisitions are constant. Um, there's a desire to be nimble, quick, um, and that relates back to our sports products, LA Galaxy, uh, LA Kings hockey team, um, our festivals, our artists, as you saw, Taylor Swift, um, Ariana Grande, and a lot of these other people who are out there touring. So we help them um, put their goal and make the fans cheer. So we have also have these name facilities out there as well too, as you guys have heard already. So some of the background that we have from an IT perspective is that we use a lot of DevOps. So last year, um, a counterpart of mine, Cyrus, spoke about the DevOps CICD pipeline. So they use a lot of that for some of our marketing websites. Uh, we have a ticketing company underneath us. So we have, for festival ticketing, we use a company called Elevate Tickets. So if you've ever had those festival wristbands and they have an RFID chip in them, uh, basically that's what our company does. So uh, they access all those access gate controls and you buy the tickets from them. Um, manage venue and operating venues. So that's where we are actually working with cities and governments and local utilities to actually put together uh, who's gonna tour through, what are, what's happening in the venue, how do we get events in there. So, and then roaming and mobile users. Obviously with touring, we have people that are all over the place. So we support an open and collaborative environment and we've been migrating out of our data centers and into the cloud. Um, and finally, because I'm here, We've had no information security department prior to 2017. So that was a goal of our, our main leader, Phil Anschutz, so that's the A in AEG. Um, he decided that we need to do security, we need to take this more seriously, so he helped establish that all across his companies in his portfolio that we do security. So at AEG, we specifically went out and did that. So the first part is how did we build this? Um, we started the department in 2017, we hired some people, we started asking questions, we started trying to figure out how the risks are, we assessed the relationships, and we started building the things out based on NIST CSF. So I don't know if you guys have done NIST CSF or seen it, 
um, we decided to use it because it's a lot, it's, it's easily relatable to the business. Um, and I can, I'll show that in the next slide as well too. So the thing I did after that once I got in there uh, was I identified VARs that could help us. So Trace3 was one of the ones I went after immediately after I started working at AEG is because I knew Ray, I knew his abilities with identity access management, and I understood what they could deliver from that perspective. So um, partnering with good people to help fill in the gaps, and then we started comprehending what incidents we were having initially. So then the next part was we started doing basic defenses. So you think of your AV, your email phishing issues, your network alerts, all those things to turn that F2 Maybe not an A plus, but at least a C or a B. Um, and then we started looking at how do we set standards, right? Because when you start a security department from scratch, there's nothing. There's no policies, there's no standards, there's no processes, there's absolutely nothing. So everything that a lot of us take for granted, like how do you do a procurement? How do you uh, implement something? How do you get a standard AV on a system in your laptop? None of that existed. Uh, a company that's been around for 17, 20 years uh, didn't have any of those things, so we had to start from scratch. So we had to build a lot of those standards, policies, frameworks. We had to identify key applications. And then we started scanning some of the basic high-level ones that we knew of and started implementing some basic security operation processes around them. So that leads us into 2019, where we are now is constructing formal run books doing some risk awareness escalation, and then now we're looking at building out our logging and SOC platform. So we're looking also at Trace3 to help us in some of those areas, and vulnerability management program, and metrics. More metrics to understand about, as you heard before in the presentation before, is data. Data means something. And data means something to us because we always have to answer the question is why do we exist? Why is security important? How do you answer that to an executive? Um, and then we're also, moving forward into our program towards 2020 is doing behavior analytics, implementing GRC, updating our risk registers, and then finally reassessing where we are. Because we, when we first came in, we created a three to five year roadmap. Um, at year two, we're pretty much done that three year roadmap, so we need to start looking at what's ahead of us now and where is the business moving. So some of you may have seen something like this. Um, the objective here is really to say, uh, this is based on NIST CSF, look at your program holistically, so the identify, protect, detect, respond, recover. Um, so I, if you take a picture, you can go to this link, you can find it from Adrian. I took a piece of this and made it into this to help our executives look at our program. So it's really, the fact is, what we're seeing here is your program holistically, right? So we're not trying to look at only network because a lot of people come from the network side, they'll only look at the network pieces. Some people come from the system side, they'll only look at the system side. Some people come from reverse engineering, red teaming, they'll only look at IR, right? So we have to look at the program holistically and all the different components that make it up. So this is where that comes in, is to help make sure that you realign yourselves that are you covering all the different areas? And then taking that one step deeper, um, this was also published through Tenable, uh, as well, I use this as a reference point. Um, ours doesn't look this messy, but the reality is, how do you map your tasks and your projects and your remediation back up, right? So you looked at it from a NIST CSF perspective, now you're looking at it from a task and management perspective. So each one of those things, so you could take, for example, like MFA, right? Multi-factor authentication, you could put it across, you could put a cost to it, you can say what's your maturity level around it because did you only do it for Office 365, or are you doing it for your homegrown applications, and are you also implementing it in other areas like VPN? So you can look at it from a maturity, and then you could also look at it from a roadmap, because you could start off with one solution that you know of today. So you could say, for example, you start off with Microsoft MFA, and then you realize it only works within Microsoft's ecosphere, right? And then you're gonna contact your Trace3 rep and decide, hey, I need to use Duo, or I need to use Okta, or I need to use another vendor at that point to identify how I'm gonna cover all the other areas, okay? And then metrics and KPI. So how do we measure these things? So in our program, for example, in the last year and a half, um, Dean Woods back there is a part of my team as well too, has helped complete 60 of these initiatives. So 60 plus things that we tracked 
and we showed our executives about where we are, how we started from zero, and where we are after a year. So some of those initiatives that we have completed is MFA, Cloud Access Security with Netscope, uh, Next Generation AV with Carbon Black Defense, email forwarding cleanup as something as simple as that, um, six, 15 security standards, and we'll get into why that's important, and then also we tested custom applications that we have developed in-house. So we track these based on the requests that come in, what projects we have, based on the remediation and tasks that we're doing, and then also the open and closed uh, incidents. So we understand all these root causes and then we move forward from there. So the reason why we point out the standards um, is because most people, we struggle in the security profession as to say, what do we measure, right? And we have lots of discussions in this internally in our company is because we, we basically are taking our standards. What is your standard, right? What is your standard operating system? What is your standard of what should be on that system? So for example, should the firewall be turned on? Should it be encrypted? Does AV need to be turned on, right? And then what is your denominator, right? And then that's where it becomes a different discussion because we know that asset management is an issue, right? But then how do we bring that up from a security perspective in a way that's meaningful. So we looked at it in a way of, this is through Power BI, um, which is we took the data out of our ServiceNow CMDB, and then we took the data out of each one of our tools, and then we're basically saying that, okay, in this example, 2,569 endpoints have carbon black defense out of 3,201 in our CMDB, right? And then it becomes a discussion with our IT team saying, well, is this right? Or is this wrong? Because we think we hit everything, but did we? And so that becomes now a cleanup project. Is CMDB correct? Is our asset management process is correct? Is our procurement process is correct? And then also on the second half is understand your incidents. Um, so from our perspective is growing incidents um, is not an issue. It's an understanding of knowing that, especially if when we started from nothing, that we started with not many tickets. And then as people got to know us, they send us more issues. And then we get lots of phishing issues. We get lots of, you know, this doesn't work, or this AV is catching this thing, or, you know, should I open this email? All those questions get routed to security, and that shows um, to us and the management that security is providing a value because we're answering these questions, we're doing something, but we also have this giant backlog. So that means we may need more resources to overcome this, or we need to fix some additional processes with our IT ops team. So the second use case that we get into is um, the festivals. So that's probably why you all came here. Um, so, <laughs> so from our security capabilities, uh, the way I look at it is um, we have identity protection, endpoint security, cloud security, and network security. And all those data feeds into our SOC. Um, so it's really only three of us right now in, in holistic of the SOC itself, but Overall, when our users, our corporate users, or our users out there, they're getting some type of MFA in email security because they're connected to the corporate network. They're now getting endpoint security from Netscope and Carbon Black Defense. So the endpoint itself is protected. So when they're not part of campus, they're still getting those protections. And then now as part of cloud security, because we leverage a lot of cloud services. We have Dropbox, we have OneDrive, we got SharePoint, we got another four other services out there. Right? We use Netscope to look at that data and understand what files are being touched, who's touching them, and how they're touching them. We relate it back to the identity information. Right? And then from a network security stack, we got Palo Alto firewalls from our major locations. And then we also have our third parties who help us build these festivals, and they're utilizing a Fortinet firewall. Right? So this is where we're doing our incident response. Our centralized logging and dashboard and metrics is fed through the SOC. So if we break it down as to what we're doing specifically on the endpoint, because that's where the most interesting things happen, especially in a festival, um, we have next-gen AV, we have EDR, and we have operational compliance utilizing from Carbon Black. So that's Carbon Black Defense and their newer product, LiveOps. So that's based off of OS Query. So OS Query allows us to query the functions of the system to tell us, is the disk encryption status on or off? Is the patch status on the latest ones working, did it install? Is, what's our firewall status? And overall, what's the serial number of the system? And does it match the database information that we have? 
right? And then when we look at it from the other's perspective is after you clean up the malware and everything else in the endpoint, now the data is going to our cloud. So how do we do that? We use Netscope, right? So we use Netscope for web filtering, and because it's all in the cloud, now we can turn on inline DLP without any lag. And then also we can look at malware inline as well as in our cloud storage. And then we can also monitor what cloud apps are being used. So that allows us to understand, especially at a festival uh, that hasn't been monitored before, now we're getting a better sense of what apps are being used by the personnel that are out there in the middle of the desert setting all this up, right? Because those apps may not be the apps that we use totally at corporate. So they do whatever they need to do to get that job done, and we need to be able to follow them. And then from the last part is OS standards and OS security. So these are things that we're utilizing from Windows 10 and Microsoft or from the Mac standards, right? So those are all making sure you have logs. What's the, what's the minimal amount of software that you need to make it functional? Um, and then turning on disk encryption and doing patches, right? So those are all basic things. And then how did we get our stats, right? Um, so we pulled all this um, pieces together and we're saying, out of 100 and some laptops that we deployed out there, we, we had 145 that were active at any point in time during Coachella. And then those devices had 105 of them had Netscope on them. So, and then 96 of them were patched, right? So these stats show us that not all the systems that we had out there were perfectly clean before they were shipped out there. So this is a discovery effort on our part since we've only been there for a year, but to understand that this is what's happening. So now we can go back with the business and figure out how do we improve those processes? How do we improve our security hygiene? How do we identify threats from the firewall side, right? There was maybe one system that had a botnet and the C2 virus going on. And then we also can check the software to identify what was installed on there, right? So now we can see whether or not it was malicious or if it was actually someone saying, hey, I need these components because it's part of a different software program. And then also, using, utilizing Netscope, we can identify what apps are being used. So you can see Google Drive, because one of our third parties use it. Uh, Dropbox is something that we sanction. Uh, Google is part of one of our subsidiaries use that as well when they're doing festivals. Facebook, and so on and so forth. So where do we go from here? How do we take these technologies and how do we add this to the enterprise, right? So um, from a simple side, how we evolve the security stack is really what we're taking is our traditional method. So what we have today is that we got an endpoint, they're going through Palo Alto and they're going out to the cloud. And then from a festival IT security perspective is we don't always control all the access ways of leaving the environment to the internet, right? So what we're doing here is really looking at implementing Netscope on the endpoint, right? And then finally, what we're doing next is now we're looking at utilizing Netscope in conjunction with our router IPsec tunnel to utilize Netscope to basically take all of our traffic from a small concert venue, right? Something that has maybe five people who work there full time. And their, their job is really to set up events, right? They're not there to manage IT, they're not manage they're not there to manage you know, the PCI or anything like that. They're really just there to make sure that it runs. right? So what are we really trying to protect? And when we deduce that down, a lot of these smaller ones, they don't need a traditional stack. right? And if I can get consistent policies and consistent protection and a very ease of deployment, I can use something like Netscope to actually give them that. So other people may have heard Zscaler. Netscope's doing this as well, but I'm getting DLP, I'm getting malware, I'm getting other things out of Netscope. So that's where the benefits are coming in for me. So business benefits really is the quick onboard and offboard of a location and a consistent user experience. So we're able to provide that and we're starting to do that with some of our venues after we prove this at Coachella. So we prove this at Coachella, now we, can, now we have the ability to talk to the business and say, hey, some of those smaller venues that you're not gonna 100% onboard because the business is the business, sometimes we buy them, sometimes we sell them, right? And sometimes we just hold them for a little bit. So if we hold them for a little bit, this is where we're starting to implement this model. For some of the massive, large venues, we'll still utilize a Palo Alto for the time being because we still have a lot of different VLANs, we still have a lot of different access control layers that we still need to maintain. Uh, but the future for us with 5G happening 
is really looking more towards the Netscope side. So the takeaways that have, and then you guys can ask any questions you want, is really, from our perspective, is really just understand your assets. Partner with great resources, like the vendors as well as Trace, um, and then track and record your achievements, because I don't think we do that enough in security overall. Any questions? Sure. So the main reason that we have the disparity is because we have, um, so the question, if any, didn't, didn't, everyone didn't hear it, is really about what's the difference? Why did we have an issue between CMDB and the assets that we had? Um, and, the, and the real reason is because we have um, different avenues of joining systems to our domain. We have different procurement methods. Um, we didn't have tight controls over financial purchasing because we have a lot of subsidiaries. So a lot of them are allowed to do different things. Um, and they were allowed to do that because of the way our business operates, which is very entrepreneurship and a lot of collaborative environments with third parties to help set up these venues. So that's where we're discovering this and we're trying to slowly lock those down. Um, so we are working towards that. We're using a lot of the Windows 10 modern management features and we're pulling that back. Anything else? Wow, you guys are all passed out? <laughs> Did I go too fast? <laughs> Thanks. Appreciate it. <laughs>